Thank you very much, Nicola, for your introduction. Um, I'm going to review some aspects related to the, the emerging, emerging infections. And I want to, first of all, to present some interesting predictions that were made in this particular case by this serious man that was Lord Calvin, president of the Royal Society in 1890 till 95. Sometimes it's dangerous to predict someone, something. And this person said that radio has no future. Okay, wrong. X-ray will prove to be a trick. Also wrong. Heavier, heavier than air, flying machines are impossible. Third wrong prediction. But this is funny. But if we move to the, the, the world of infectious diseases, there are also dangers of predicting the future. And this is the prediction that was, that was made by Aidan Cockburn in his book about the evolution and eradication of infectious diseases in 1963. It seems reasonable to anticipate that within some measurable time, all the major infections will have disappeared. And this is also a prediction by the U.S. Surgeon, Surgeon General in 1967. It's time to close the books on infectious diseases. So all of these guys are very good visionaries because any, any one of these predictions were were uh, true. So let's move to the pulmonary infections because infectious diseases accounted for about 26% of the 50 million deaths worldwide in 2002. So this is a very, very huge number of people that die related to infectious problems. Globally, they are the, they are the second leading cause of death following cardiovascular diseases and emerging infections are identified every year, and the majority of them are or come from the animals. I love to show you this image that is the view of the city of Los Angeles from, from the observatory, the Mount Wilson Observatory. This uh, image was taken at the beginning of the 20th century, and this is the same city right now, so the difference between the lights that we can see at the beginning of the 20th century and now is incredibly high. So the same what happened with the infections. So infections, emerging infections have been defined the, to those that have a newly appeared, that have appeared previously but are expanded in incidence and geographic range or those that threaten to increase in the near future. So all of these group of infections are related to the world emerging. 75% of these pathogens are transmitted from animals to humans. So in the, fop, in the proximal minutes, we are talking about the review, the epidemiology of, and the causative agents of some of these infections. We are going to discuss the role of imaging in the diagnosis of a suspected lung infection. And we are going to illustrate the high-resolution CT findings and some histological changes in these disorders. So this is a graph that shows that a lot of uh, infections appear in all over the world. But we are going to talk about several of them, healthcare associated pneumonia, severe associated respiratory uh, uh, syn syndrome, H1N1, this is an influenza pneumonia, and the antiviruses. What is the role of the imaging in the diagnosis of pulmonary infection? As you know, imaging is part of routine evaluation of patients with suspected pneumonia, and plain film is the first line imaging test to detect or exclude pneumonia. 
And we have to know that the sensitivity and specificity and inter-observer agreement in order to evaluate the plane films is really low. CT is not a primary tool in order to evaluate infections, but is increasingly used to detect and characterize the infiltrates. What are the indications of a CT? First of all, is to confirm a clinical suspicion of infection in the face of a normal chest radiograph. So in our hospital, we have a protocol uh, that has been established in cooperation with the hematologist, as has been mentioned by Professor Heusel before, that in any immunocompromised patient with fever or with any kind of symptoms, respiratory symptoms, they, we have an image very immediately, and if the image is normal, we do a CT after the plain film. So this is an emergency uh, related to this group, to, to, the, to this special group of people. Also, CT is important to characterize infiltrates. Sometimes the infiltrates are very difficult to evaluate using plain films. So we have to go to CT in order to see some additional findings that may help us to found an appropriate diagnosis. And also, it's also useful to demonstrate associated complications. Again, as a guide for the optimal site for a bronchoalveolar lavage or in order to establish a follow-up. And it's very important to keep in mind that in the absence of clinical information, radiologists cannot distinguish between pneumonia and other pulmonary processes. It's impossible to distinguish these, uh, these uh, uh, differences between one uh, infectious process from one vasculitic process or from one tumoral process. So let's start with the healthcare-associated pneumonia. The definition is this pneumonia that develops outside the hospital. But there are several points that we have to keep in mind. First, this kind of disease affects patients who have been hospitalized for two or more days in the past three months. Second, Residents in a nursing home or long-term care facility. Third, to those patients who have received dialysis or intravenous therapy at a hospital-based clinic in the past 30 years. So there are little differences between the typical community acquired pneumonia. There are patients that are living outside the hospital, but that they maintain some relationship with the hospital environment and also patients receiving home intravenous antibiotics, home nursing, or home want care. So all of these group of patients are together in the, this uh, newly uh, accepted type of uh, pneumonia, healthcare-associated pneumonia. What is the these differences between healthcare-associated pneumonia and community-acquired pneumonia? And healthcare-associated pneumonia, pathogens are often the same that multidrug-resistant bacteria. So that means that the, uh, the, uh, um, the, um, the type of, of the microorganisms are much uh, aggressive than those that the normal people have uh, or uh, are infected in the or by the community-acquired pneumonia. And these kind of pathogens are similar to those that are associated in hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator acquired pneumonia. So there are very aggressive uh, pathogens. The most common uh, pathogens related to healthcare associated pneumonia is the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, and Usually in the community acquired pneumonia, in the typical community acquired pneumonia, the most common pathogen is the streptococcus pneumonia. So, healthcare associated pneumonia and the CA MRSA is a common cause of 
healthcare associated pneumonia occurring in 20 to 30 percent of the cases. If we compare healthcare associated pneumonia with, with hospital acquired pneumonia, there is a similar mortality, 20 percent of the patients. So if we compare the mortality between community acquired pneumonia and healthcare associated pneumonia, uh, healthcare acquired pneumonia, the mortality is also high. The community acquired pneumonia related to uh, MRSA is very typical because there is a kind of a necrotizing pneumonia, sometimes associated with fasciitis necroticans of the soft tissues. And this is a chart that shows that the number, the increase of the number of healthcare associated pneumonia that have been reported since 2002. And here, if we compare the mortality between healthcare associated pneumonia and hospital associated pneumonia, we see that there is no significant difference between these two groups. But if we compare these two groups with those patients that present community acquired pneumonia, the mortality is really high in the group of patients related to healthcare associated pneumonia and those related to hospital acquired pneumonia. So the mortality of the patients that have a healthcare associated pneumonia is really elevated. Here is an example of a patient, 39 year old woman with MRSA pneumonia who died from septic shock and respiratory failure. This is the, the first uh, chest film, multiple bilateral areas of uh, consolidation. There is no pleural fusion, nor fissural uh, thickening, and he is the same individual 48, 48 hours later. There is a much more severe uh, 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 pulmonary involvement bilateral with a huge areas of consolidation. So these patients present a very, uh, very, uh, uh, very fast evol evolution of the consolidation and after consolidation, necrotizing uh, findings are usually found. This is another patient with healthcare associated pneumonia. Here is the plain film and it's difficult to see the presence of uh, areas of necrosis, but in the corresponding CT, we see the consolidation that is much more evident in the right lung and the multiple areas of uh, cystic lesions or necrotic lesions that appear in this patient. Let's move to the viruses. Viral infection may affect the lung parenchyma and the lung responds in several ways to this infection. The lung responds as a bronchiolitis and then we anatomopathologically see epithelial necrosis, the presence of uh, intraluminal eosinophilic exudate or infiltration of the wall by mononuclear cells. Other response from the lung parenchyma is in the form of consolidation, pneumonia, and then when we can see airspace hemorrhage and edema, we can see diffuse alveolar damage in the acute form or hyaline membrane formation. And also another, fine, another form of response from the lung is the presence of nodules of consolidations with surrounding hemorrhage. And this is the so-called nodular opacities with halocyne. So let's review some of these particular uh, cases. The common viruses, respiratory syncytial viruses, parainfluenza, influenza, the target is the bronchial epithelium. So these viruses go directly to affect the bronchial epithelium. And then we are going to see on uh, CT findings of related to bronchiolitis or bronchopneumonia. What happened with the new pathogens? SARS, the coronary virus, affects the bronchial epithelium, but also the alveoli. The antiviruses affects mainly the vascular endothelium. And H1N1 affects both the bronchial epithelium and alveoli, but also the endothelium. So if we know these areas of the lung that are affected by the, these different viruses, then we can understand 
the CT findings all of this uh, group of infections. We we'll start with SARS. And this is an uh, interesting disease that happened years ago in, in 2003. And this is the result or the summary of the conclusion of what happened with SARS. So nobody underst and, uh, understand almost nothing, only the data here and SARS here, and the rest was absolutely understandable. But what's, what happened in, in China uh, years ago? And finally, uh, all the newspapers in the world would uh, uh, reproduce this kind of, uh, of, uh, of epidemic and this is an infectious disease with a significant morbidity and mortality that, uh, that was caused by a new coronavirus and not restricted to the respiratory tract. The gastrointestinal tract was also involved. So at this moment, there was panic in all over the world related to this severe acute respiratory syndrome. And after the first 10 days, the patient usually died related to a diffuse alveolar damage. What is the radiology at presentation in the SARS? 80% of the cases present with abnormal chest X-ray. More than 50% of the cases present a focal, ill-defined peripheral airspace disease. And less than 50% of the cases presented with bilateral, ill-defined airspace disease. Pathologically, there the histology is characterized by a diffuse alveolar damage. In this particular infection, there is a um, very typical the presence of alveolar pneumocytes with this cytomegalic granular uh, cytoplasms. We can see also here in the, in the, in through, into the uh, alveolar space. And the pathological features of patients with severe acute respiratory syndromes are related mainly to these two pathological findings, first pulmonary edema and hyaline membrane presence of in the intraalveolar space. And this uh, is the typical uh, histological uh, findings of a severe uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Also, some of them may, uh, uh, may uh, evolve to develop interstitial fibrosis. The manifestations, uh, CT manifestations of SARS include ground glass opacity, areas of consolidation, and they may present as a crazy paving that can be relatively well defined or can be observed multilateral or bilateral. Sometimes they are a subpleural uh, uh, in, uh, involvement, often in the lower lung, in the lower lungs and there is also septal thickening. Here is an example of a patient that presents a plain field, very difficult to see if there is something, maybe some areas of ill-defined consolidation, but this is the evolution very shortly after the first plain field. Here is an example of a patient with a dyspnea, plus 12 hours after the admission, the plain field is really normal, but the corresponding CT scan shows these multiple areas of ground glass opacities throughout both lungs. Let's move to the pandemic influenza H1N1. The influenza is a seasonal, uh, uh, there are three types of uh, influenza. First, the seasonal influenza, the avian influenza, and the pandemic influenza. We are going to talk about the pandemic influenza that is related to the H1N1 virus, that it's a virulent human influenza that causes a global outbreak or pandemic of serious illness. There is little natural immunity and easy person-to-person -person transmission. This is a chart that shows the different outbreaks and epidemic uh, cases of uh, influenza and this is the, the most tragic influenza was in the 1918 by H1N1. It was called Spanish influenza. There are several outbreaks throughout the 19th and 20th century. And now there is the last uh, 
pandemic influenza that occurred in 2009 by the H1N1 virus. In April 2009, an outbreak of a human infection with a novel H1N1 influenza was reported in Mexico. The clinical manifestations were cough, fever, short throat, diarrhea, and nausea. And in September of 2009, several months later, 122 countries with almost 300,000 people were reported to have this kind of infection with almost 3,000 associated deaths. In August 6, 2010, one year later, 214 countries and 18,400 deaths. So this was, uh, it was a really epidemic. This is a case of a 37-year-old pregnant woman with muscular pain, fever, 72 hours after the onset of symptoms. And we can see multiple rounded, ill-defined opacities that are much clearer visible on the left lung. The case definition established by CDC related to H1N1 is or include those persons with an influenza-like illness and patients that have confirmation by the laboratory an influenza A virus in one or more of the following tests, real-time PCR and viral culture. So all of these criteria are uh, mandatory to define the H1N1 infection. Pathologically, there is a typical findings of a hyaline membranes, this uh, diffuse alveolar damage. We see the alveolar wall here and these hyaline membranes within the alveolar lumen. There is also a clear thickening of the alveolar septum and also the presence of edema within the uh, alveoli. Here there is a hyperplasia of type 2 pneumocytes in addition to a hemorrhagic content of the alveolar space. And here there is an inflammation and necrosis of the bronchiolar wall. So if you remember what are the target areas of the lung that are uh, affected by each one and one infections are bronchi, alveoli, but also the endothelium. And here is uh, the histology of a medium caliber blood vessel wall when we see the intimal inflammation between the endothelial cells. So this causing this increase in density of the subendothelial area, and this is an endotheliitis. So the target are bronchi and also vessels. Here is a case, 45-year-old woman after drastic banding who presented 48 hours after the onset of fever and sore throat. And this is the typical, typical but non-specific finding that we can find in this particular infection. In this case, there is a consolidation that uh, also is associated with a blurring of the, uh, at the right atrium. Here is another case with multiple bilateral areas of consolidation, also non-specific. And this is interesting because on high-resolution CT, we can see much more appearances related to this particular uh, infection. We can see areas of airspace consolidation. We can also see ground glass opacities. They may be unilateral or bi bilateral. And also we can see also isma small ill-defined nodules different to uh, those seen in small airways disease and also a peribronchovascular or subpleural areas of consolidation. Here there are two examples of areas of consolidation, unilateral, affecting the subpleural part of this lung. Here is another case showing multiple rounded areas of ground glass opacity in a, a typical or asymmetric distribution, 
in the lung basis, the effect, the pulmonary involvement is much, uh, much evident, but also there are multiple areas in other parts of the lung. There is a kind of a reticulation associated with the ground glass opacity, giving the appearance of a crazy paving. Here is another case of H1N1 that presents this severe pattern with a consolidation that is also associated with distortion of the bronchovascular structures with a deformation of the lung parenchyma. This is the coronal, coronal reformation, and you see very well how the lungs are uh, stressed to the upper parts of the lung with a distortion of the bronchial structure, and this is a typical example of an organizing pneumonia pattern. There is also an organizing pneumonia pattern related to H1N1, areas of consolidation. Some of the areas are subpleural, others are following the bronchovascular bundles. Note that there is some kind of dilatation of the bronchi that are involved by the consolidation. This is one case that was biopsied in my hospital of a patient with a this particular case with particular findings that are perilobular, areas of consolidation, and this is the biopsy that shows this organizing tissue here, reflecting the presence of a organizing pneumonia pattern in this particular case. Here, this is a small nodule of the same etiology. Also, the reverse halocyne has been related to the H1N1 infection, and this is a patient with multiple rounded areas of ground glass opacity, but these areas are surrounded by this increase of density given the typical appearance of a reversed allosine. So the appearances of findings related to H1N1 are multiple, and nothing or no one of them really diagnostic of the infection. This is a particular case also that presents thickening of the bronchial walls and centrilobular areas of ground glass and small um, free and bad pattern here. So a variable um, manifestation. Let's move to the last uh, group of patients related to the vital infections. This group is uh, um, related to the antiviruses. The antiviruses was described in 1993 in New Mexico in the United States. Healthy adults develop severe respiratory failure, but this failure was associated with a very critical uh, clinical status with a thrombocytopenia and hypotension and with an acute mortality of more than 50%. So the etiologic agent at the moment of the epidemic was unknown, but uh, after several uh, months, there was the described uh, an antivirus as the cause of this uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. There is a respiratory failure. There are two clinical groups, those that present with a respiratory failure associated with hypotension, and this is the called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Usually, uh, they, there is the scene number like virus, the origin of this. There is a rapidly progressive and high mortality related to this syndrome. And the, particularly, the particularity of this syndrome is that there is no renal disease nor bleeding. Nearly 2,000 cases in the Americas since this virus was recognized. And the other clinical syndrome is the hemorrhagic fever plus renal syndrome. His hemorrhagic fever plus renal syndrome is much more common than the antivirus pulmonary syndrome and can be finally in Europe and Asia. This is only related to the North, the American continent. This can be uh, visible in Europe and Asia too. Remember that the, the target of the virus is the vascular endothelium, and then we can see the presence of interstitial edema that may progress to a diffuse alveolar damage. So the reactions of the lung 
related to these different kinds of viruses are very similar. And this is a very, very uh, critical reaction with a high mortality rate associated with it. The imaging related to this antivirus infection is the presence of an interstitial pattern, septal lines, that are related mainly to the interstitial edema. In approximately 50% of the cases, the disease progressed to an aerospace disease because of the development of a diffuse alveolar damage. And this can occur in the following 24 to 48 hours after the presence of interstitial edema. In this particular uh, group of patients, pleural effusion is also fine, found. And here is a typical case of uh, antivirus uh, pulmonary syndrome that present the early radiographic features. That is, uh, that uh, there are multiple uh, septal lines, blurring of the bronchovascular bundles, bilateral, also the cardiac silhouette is not visible. This is the previous phase of the syndrome that uh, is related to the interstitial edema. This is the progression of a patient with antivirus pulmonary syndrome from the interstitial edema to diffuse alveolar damage. This is the first time, the, the first uh, point of the evolution. This is the interstitial lung disease that in 48 hours uh, the evolution is going to a uh, diffuse alveolar damage with uh, the development of a white lungs and a dual respiratory di distress syndrome. Here is an, a case that uh, the progression is from the interstitial edema to the resolution of the infection. And after the appropriate treatment, the patient recovers completely and the lung looks normal. We have uh, talking about uh, two groups of clinical syndromes related to the antivirus uh, viruses, and this is one that presents with hemorrhagic fever, but with renal syndrome. There are no other, uh, there are no other uh, clinical associations. And this is a, a case that uh, courtesy of Dr. Hello from Vienna that affect a 30-year-old male with shortness of breath, fever, malaise, proteinuria, and abdominal pain. The plain film is also non-specific, but reflects a non-cardiogenic pulmonary interstitial edema. And if we do the CT, we can identify the thickening of the septal lines, the interlobular septa that are very nice visible in the lung bases, but also in the upper parts of the lung. This is the interstitial edema that uh, correspond to this phase. And also we can also find these multiple small nodules with a center much more dense than the periphery. And this is a small nodular opacity related to a hollow sign. And here is the recovery of the patient after the appropriate treatment. So this is the second, the second group of clinical uh, uh, the clinical syndromes related to the antivirus infection. So, as a conclusion, viruses are the most common cause of emerging infectious disease worldwide. Emerging infections are associated with considerable morbidity and mortality. Imaging findings are an important component of the diagnosis of these infections, and they are variable and closely related to the underlying pathologic abnormalities. If we understand the pathologic abnormalities, the, under the, the, the background of the imaging, we can understand why these uh, particular uh, different infectious processes may present with the imaging that have been uh, presented to you. So take care with the emergent infections, and thank you very much for your attention.